G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Best Fiends a huge shout out for sponsoring this episode. And you know, when you finish binging the latest riveting podcast on your list, there's always one lingering question staring you in the face, right? And now what? I'm sure you could surf the net and deep dive down the Wikipedia wormhole, researching everything related to the show, but when your brain or your browser tabs are full to the brim, it might be time to take a break from it all and change the pace up. And this is when I like to kick back and clear a few levels on Best Fiends. Recently too, I've really enjoyed some of the levels and the puzzles, especially some of the boss levels, and I've actually played it a few times between recording sessions when I need to rest my voice and take a quick break, which has been a really nice way to play. And I think that's what I love about Best Fiends the most. It's a fantastic boredom quencher, but also it's great for casual gameplay and moments of downtime throughout the day. I also love that more levels, events, challenges are always being added, so the game never really runs out of things to do. The game is also free to download and has literally millions of 5 star reviews on the Apple App Store and Google Play, which really doesn't surprise me because it's just a great little game that always leaves me with that just one more level feeling. So, download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. This happened about eight years ago. I was 16 and had two friends living with me so they could go to college. They were from out of town and loved the beach. I lived on the coast. The beach is a lot like a home for my mum and she used to walk on the beach and collect shells almost every day. And one day we went and my mum went to a bar that was close to where we had parked so she could have a beer. About 30 minutes goes by and my mum still hasn't come back to the car so we went to check on her to make sure that she was okay. And she was acting very weird and saying things that just didn't make sense. There was a guy with her who was obviously in a biker gang, huge dude by the way, tatted everywhere, leather vest, probably like 6'5", 250 pounds. I would assume the guy thought that she was alone at the bar from the look on his face when my friends and I went to check on my mum. And I told my mum that it was time to go but she didn't want to leave this guy. She kept saying that she wasn't leaving unless he came with us. We got staff at the bar to tell her that it's time to go and that she's too drunk to drive. I didn't have a license too at the time, so one of my friends had to drive. But this is where it gets really weird. So we're on our way home and my mum keeps looking at her hands and asking us why they're moving. She was moving her fingertips around, so we were just telling her that she was drunk and that they're moving because she's moving them. To be honest, we just didn't really think much of it. She also kept telling us though that she only had two beers. We get home and my mum gets out of the car and sits down in the driveway. There was a child riding a tricycle across the street from us and my mum said, Hey little kid, you're not old enough to have a license, you shouldn't be driving. But we thought that it was funny at the time because, well, we thought that she had just overdone it on the alcohol. We get her inside and put her in her bed and tell her to just go to sleep. We went back to my room to play some video games and chill. And about 30 minutes goes by and we hear something break and my mum started screaming. It wasn't like a normal scream too. It was terrifying. And just writing this gives me chills thinking about how it sounded in fact. We ran to her room and she had broken off a, a glass of water that we poured for her by her bed. When we got into her room, she stopped screaming and stared blankly at the wall, just mumbling stuff that didn't make any sense. She would uh, glance at us, but you could tell that her mind wasn't there. There was a blankness in her eyes, and her pupils were absolutely huge. I hadn't messed with drugs at all at this point, and neither had my friends, so at the time we didn't know anything. We get her to lay back down though and try to go to sleep. But before we left the room, she was just staring at the ceiling, moving her jaw around. We went back to my room and talked about what we were going to do. We started to get scared because we knew that something wasn't right. And about 10 minutes goes by and we hear the car start. My friend stayed with her at the car trying to convince her to unlock the door and give them the key. I ran down to a neighbor and asked them to help because something was wrong with my mum. She ended up backing out of the driveway and got about halfway down the street and then just slammed the brakes on. 
We were going to break her car windows, jump in and turn the car off, but she unlocked the car thankfully, stepped out of it and, and just walked home. We drove the car back to the driveway and I put the keys in my pocket. When we walked back inside, she was sitting on the edge of her bed again with a blank stare, but was now kind of twitching. We went to my room again and were talking about how crazy this situation was. And about an hour goes by, so we started thinking everything was calm and she was asleep until we heard breaking glass again. We went to the kitchen and she had quietly opened the dishwasher, taken frozen food out of the freezer and grabbed a pack of computer paper. She was also throwing plates at the wall and putting frozen food and computer paper into the dishwasher. And when we asked her what she was doing, she just looked over at us with a blank stare and continued what she was doing without giving us an answer. After that, we got her back into her room and I monitored her until I was sure that she went to sleep. I stayed in her room for a couple of hours and then I went to my room and I went to sleep. The next morning she called me and was freaking out instantly because she didn't remember anything and didn't even know how she got home. Apparently she had given the guy from the bar her number and he was calling her from random numbers all morning. We went to CVS and got a drug test to verify that she was actually drugged and yep, she had roofies and PCP in her system. When we called the bar to get the security footage so we could try and find out who this guy was... They told us that their security system had been broken for a long time. When I was a teenager growing up in Southern California, it wasn't uncommon to hitchhike with my friends. This was way before Uber or Lyft and my friends and I actually always came out with cool stories from our experiences as nothing really bad ever happened to me yet. But we had some basic rules for hitchhiking. I won't go over them all, but the number one rule was to never get into a van. The next biggest one was never get into a vehicle with more than two guys. Southern California at the time had a ton of 18 and under clubs too that also had 18 and over within. And bartenders could always tell who was of drinking age by the band on their arm. It was not hard back then too to slip off your under 18 band and slip a drinking age one on but this was the 90s after all, so it wasn't strict at all. My friends and I had decided that it was time to leave though, but I had told my grandparents, who were raising me, that I was spending the night at a friend's house. I wasn't ready to go and let my friends leave without me, so when I decided to leave, I admit that I had a little too much to drink and was probably visibly intoxicated at this point. We had pages back in those days too, and I had paged my friend, who I was staying with that night, that I was headed that way. I started to walk the three to four miles to the apartment complex when a vehicle pulled up. The guy was kind of cute, and my inhibitions were gone, so I ignored the safety rules. The first rule ignored was that it was a van. The second rule ignored was it was a van full of guys. But me being stupid me, I crawled in anyway. As soon as the van door closed, I knew that I had made a huge mistake. The cute guy summoned me to sit on his lap in the passenger seat, to which I obliged. He started groping me too, and the entire vibe changed immediately. I knew that I was in trouble. I played along though, and started talking about an after party with all of my hot friends, some that were models in fact, in hopes of putting their focus on something else. The driver summoned me to sit on his lap, which I obliged again. He would take his hands off the wheel, and when I would grab the steering wheel, he would grab me inappropriately. I felt that these four guys in the van were looking for an area to take me, and I knew what would happen if they found one. I then went into an elaborate story about how these parties usually went. I told of how Molly and alcohol were abundant, and how they were expecting me to bring the cute guys. I played these guys to the best of my ability, because... I knew that my well-being counted on it, and thankfully, they took the bait. The apartment complex had a few other complexes around it, with a park in the center. I had these guys pull up at a park, across from the park, approximately the size of a football field from where I was actually going. I played out how much fun we were all going to have, and as soon as the van door opened, I 
booked it, and I ran as fast as I could across the park, and I could hear the guys yelling and coming after me, but I was too afraid to look back, and I just kept running. I hit the complex next to where I was actually going, and found a stairwell that had a few bikes chained to it, and I slid under the staircase. I could hear the guys yelling for me and getting close. I was afraid that my breathing was loud, and I was convinced that they might even hear my heart beating. It was so loud in my ears, but... I tucked into the fetal position and I closed my eyes tight. I guess subconsciously I just thought that if I couldn't see them then they couldn't see me. Stupid I know, but I tried my hardest to control my breathing and my heartbeat too. I stayed under that staircase for what seemed like hours. They never found me too, but not for lack of trying, that's for sure. I was too scared to move and I felt like they were waiting and watching, so I was frozen. Eventually, I finally had the courage to move and carefully made my way to my friend's house where I was staying. I made it, and finally, I was safe. I never did hitch a ride from a stranger again after that. I knew just how lucky I was, and I know very well what could have happened, and I will forever be grateful that I did not become a statistic that night. Valuable lessons were learned that night. Like number one... Never stay when your friends are ready to leave, and always stay in a group. 2. Do not allow yourself to get so altered that you throw away common sense, especially if you're alone. 3. Never go against your gut feelings, no matter how attractive or nice a person may appear to be. 4. Never accept a ride from strangers. 5. Never place yourself in a position of being outnumbered. And 6. Give thanks when you're able to see the blessings that you've been given. So I work as a front desk at a hotel and within the past six months we had a guest that unfortunately passed away in one of our rooms. But because of this pandemic my boss has blocked off the room even after deep cleaning just to be safe. Due to the hotel business not doing so well too, he also has a couple of rooms cut off from the power, which means that none of the electronics are working for those rooms, including phones, and this plays a big part in this story. Now, our hotel has two phones up at the front, one for external calls and the other specifically for internal lines, which are only connected to the phones in each guest room. I was having another quiet day during my shift alone, business isn't running as normal and all of the housekeepers had left for the day and the only staff left was the maintenance guy and I. I get an internal phone call from one of the rooms and answer it as I usually do and it's just static noises, along with an occasional cut in between, like the noise you get when you unplug your headphones from a device. To be honest, I didn't think anything at first and thought it was a guest accidentally calling the front desk, so I wait a little more and then I just hang up. But then I realized that the call was from the same room that the guest passed away in, and there's no way that a call could be made from that room because the phone is unplugged. I was a little bit spooked by that, so... I asked the maintenance man who was just chilling in the back office to go and check out the room and make sure the power is still out. He comes back and sure enough, the phone is still unplugged and even took a picture of it. Then he also has a log of what rooms have power and all the other mechanics and stuff. We even checked the lobby cameras to make sure if someone didn't go into the rooms and no, nothing. No housekeepers went in or out of the room at all within the past week in fact. Just as we were done checking the camera footage too, I received another phone call from that exact same room. And this time, it was just silent for a good 10 seconds or so. Then the same static noise, but this time way louder. I hung up the phone so fast that a guest asked if everything was okay, but obviously I didn't tell her. I sat there and tried to think of every scientific possible way that this could have been an internal mistake, such as outside sales calls accidentally getting caught within our internal calls, but that's just not possible. Especially if the phone cord was not plugged in. I mean, everything is impossible. I guess that I'll update you guys if anything else happens during my shift, but this whole thing, it has me spooked.
So I'm staying with a friend for a little while, and this was at her house. So my friend was asleep next to me, and I was awake and crying a little bit. Enough for my throat to burn, but not enough to wake my friend up. It was around 1.30 in the morning when the door to our room cracked open. I looked over and called out the name of her mum, thinking that she was coming to check in on us that night. But instead, I see the figure of a man crawl into the room on its hands and feet. It was like really low bear crawl too, keeping very close to the ground. Then the figure stands up and it was huge. A really tall man who was entirely black with absolutely no face. We made eye contact for a solid second. Well, at least I think it was eye contact because I couldn't see his eyes before it just vanished right before me. I'm a pretty spiritual person, I admit, but I've never experienced anything like this before. I got a really bad vibe from that spirit and turned on a light in the hallways once I got my bearings again. I did eventually manage to fall asleep and when I woke up, the first thing I did was cleanse the house and put on a protection ward, banishing the spirit. I think this thing wanted to feed off of my negative energy and I've been having a tough time lately, being in the midst of a very turbulent part of my life. Like I said too, I had been crying just before the spirit entered the room and I cannot express just how many bad vibes I got from the whole experience. I do have some questions obviously, like why the heck did it crawl into the room like that? How did it manage to open the closed door? Where did it come from? I also wonder what this thing's real intentions were and if it was coming for me or for my friend who was sleeping beside me. I'm really not sure it expected to be seen by me, seeing as how quickly it vanished when we made eye contact. But why did it crawl like that? Why? Of all the things you could do as a, a creepy spirit, why that one? This isn't the first ghost that I've seen. Like I said, I'm pretty spiritual and that's why I'm talking so frankly about it because, well, I believe in this stuff but it's definitely been one of the closest and definitely the scariest encounters that I've ever had. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always like camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail that I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle, looked for protection, and jumped into my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot and head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumbled upon this nice sized clearing and decided that it's a nice beautiful spot to settle down. I'm pretty exhausted at this point, but set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and managed to get a fire going. I roast some food and I start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg or something, as it sounded like the animal was making a, a walking or dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but... It was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and I just go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag and I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state that I can't go to sleep, so I pull out a book that I brought with me and I start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and then I hear that sound again and this time it was closer in fact right at the opposite side of the clearing surprised i put my book down and i listen to this animal walk or drag across the clearing towards my tent it's really loud at this point and it sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after like the deer is dragging something along it makes it about what i assume is the middle of the clearing and stops and then i nothing. No breathing and I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness and I'm like what the hell? Unnerved at this point I zip the tent back up and just sit there listening for any other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there's a lot of strange noises in the woods and I try not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. 
I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing or just a product of being half asleep or something. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions, all different, i.e. old men, old women, even some children, and confirm that it is indeed real. The noises are closing in and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off in the air in case they came too close. There's something about this laughter though, how far in I was and the noise earlier, and the time of night told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was just dead quiet. I mean, not even the wind was making any noise. I decided at this point that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. So relaxing just a bit and figuring that I must have scared whoever off, I sat down in my exhausted state and eventually I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety and... It was still dark outside. And then, I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and I listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? And the voices, they fall silent. I shout again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? And suddenly, a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around it. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and then it just goes completely dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and I sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was, and... I just hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the entire way. Strangely, I never heard anyone follow me and I never saw anyone or anything the whole way. But I just couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that too, my enjoyment of camping alone left me. Just like I left all my gear in the woods that night. So the neighborhood that I grew up in was fairly small. The neighborhood was shaped like a T and there were maybe 20 houses total along the two streets that made it up that is. Now, across the road from our little community was a large church with a huge graveyard. The church was situated in a gentle bowl-like curve in the road so that the road had a bend on it either side and you couldn't see the church or the graveyard coming from either direction. Some of the graves in this graveyard were in fact old enough that the names and the dates had been worn away by the elements, but the grounds were well cared for and never got overgrown or anything. It was a stark juxtaposition to the tangled woods that lurked behind the church, that's for sure, always hungry to encroach on the manicured grass and neat rows of the headstones. Overall, it was just kind of too perfect, chillingly idyllic if that's the right way to express it, and vaguely threatening particularly because of its picturesque appearance. I mean, honestly, I can't say that I even remember a single time that the grass was allowed to grow too long. Weeds were never allowed to creep into the flowers planted at each grave, or a single flower was allowed to wilt on the plants or anything. But the biggest issue, though, was that this graveyard was very haunted. The whole neighborhood was, really, including my childhood home. At night, large blue orbs would bob slowly between the graves at about chest height, like ghostly lanterns. The church parishes would tell stories about cold spots, visions of lost loved ones, prayer candles mysteriously snuffing out on their own, and Bibles and hymn books being flung onto the floor by unseen hands, and just everything. But the most terrifying and common apparition that came from this church was a graveyard hitchhiker, or that's what we called it anyway. I personally encountered her on three separate occasions, and everyone in the neighborhood had seen her at least once. 
She caused several wrecks, and some with casualties even, over the 20 years that I lived there, and it was said that anyone who died because of her would be forced to wander with her until she found peace. The first time that I saw her, I was just a kid, maybe six or seven. It was a Friday, and my dad picked me up from the elementary school, and as per tradition, he had taken me to the bread box for a blue raspberry slush and a 50 cent old fashioned mini cherry pie. You all know the ones that I mean, right? But he made me pinky promise not to tell my mum because she'd get mad that he'd spoil me before dinner and all that. So, there I am in the passenger seat of Dad's little red Ford S10, munching on the last bit of my pie as we pull up to the entrance street to our neighbourhood, when a woman dashes out of the graveyard directly in front of my Dad's car. He slams the brakes so hard that they screech and they stop the truck just in time to only tap the palms of the woman's hands where she had thrown them out in front of her. And immediately, I knew that something was wrong. Her light auburn hair was snarled and had bits of leaves and twigs caught in it. The summer dress that she was wearing was torn and blood was sleeping onto the brightly patterned cloth in several places. She also had a split lip and a black eye and several cuts and bruises on her. My dad rolls down the window and asks if she's okay and if she needs help. Immediately, she gets hysterical, sobbing and tears streaking her cheeks and begs him to take her to the nearest hospital. She says that her life depends on it and begs him to please hurry and help her. My dad has me scoot to the middle of the bench seat and this woman opens the door, gets in and buckles up. Her arm brushes mine as the seatbelt clicks in place and I shudder because I had never felt skin just so cold like that. My dad pulls into the church parking lot, reverses, and heads towards the St. Mary's Hospital that's about 15 minutes from her house I'd say. But as soon as we round the bend in the road, she just vanishes. Like right before our eyes, she's just gone. The seatbelt is still buckled and we could still see the print of her hand on the window, but she was just gone, just like that. I get pretty freaked out and I start to cry. My dad gets out looking around, knocking on doors and asking if anyone has seen her. And after about 10 minutes, my dad gets back into the truck looking puzzled and pale and we just go home. We don't mention this at home and I decide eventually not to tell mum or my sisters so that they wouldn't laugh, call me crazy or say my imagination was acting up again. But dad had seen her. He knew too and he didn't talk about it too so I decided that I wouldn't either. After a few days I'd forgotten the whole incident and didn't spare this ghost another thought. Well that is until years later when she stopped my mum. By this time, I was an angry and sullen 7th grader who liked loud rock music, preferred books to people, and was constantly getting in trouble at school. This particular day, Mum was bringing me home after a meeting with the principal. I'd gotten into a fight in my lunch period with three other students. Mum was furious at me because I'd punched one boy and bitten another after they dumped my lunch tray on the floor. The principal had called her in for a meeting after school to discuss what to do about my behaviour. And as it was sometime in the fall, it was already starting to get dark when we headed home at about 4.30. This time though, when the woman ran out in front of us, in that self same summer dress, despite the chill in the air, she was just too close and mum wasn't able to hit the brakes fast enough and we actually hit her. Not hard enough to cause serious damage, but enough to make her fall. You could hear the thud as the van made contact with her stomach and the nasty wet sound of a body hitting concrete. It always makes me cringe thinking about that too. My mom obviously freaks out but she has knee and feet problems and she didn't get out of the car. She opens the door and leaned a little out as the woman shakily stood. My mom asked if she was okay and needed an ambulance but didn't get an answer. As soon as the woman looked up, my mom shut up and whispered, Oh my goodness. The woman stumbled as if drunk towards my mum, and my mum instinctively pulled the door closed to keep a barrier between her and the ghost. The woman asks my mum to please take her to a hospital, and my mum refuses. She says that she can call an ambulance, but she'll not give the woman a ride. And at this point, she gets really upset, and she just starts shrieking. My already upset mum shrieks back that she won't risk her daughter's life to give a stranger a ride. 
The ghost girl falls silent and looks at her for a moment before looking at me and begging, help, please help. I stutter out something about not being old enough to drive and the ghost wails, you could have helped me. And then, again, she literally just vanished without a trace. That night, my mum mentions at a dinner and my dad and my brother and older sisters get really pale and quiet. But the ghost woman is all mum can talk about for a week and I start to pick up on the fact that my sisters may have seen this thing too. I start asking some of the other kids in the neighbourhood and they tell me wild tales about lost souls and how this ghost is responsible for all the car accidents that happen in the church. I'm pretty freaked out, but some part of me is still sceptical enough to scoff, despite my own experiences with this said ghost. But the last time that I saw her was just a few months later. So, I was hanging out at the church trick-or-treat with the three siblings who lived across the street from me. It was freezing out, and I was dressed as a vampire. Despite the dress covering basically everything important, the material was still thin and the cape that I was wrapped in didn't have much warmth. But at some point, the parents of the kids that I was with ran out of the candy that they brought to the trunk or treat, packed us up in the car, and started to pull out of the parking lot. And just as they pulled out onto the road to cross over into our neighbor's entrance, their mum screamed for her husband to stop as this woman darted straight in front of the car. I only just barely caught a glimpse of that same bloodied sundress and her wide brown eyes for an instant. He slammed the brakes and the car went skidding down the small inclined church driveway, spinning in a full circle before slamming into the curb beside someone's driveway. All of us kids were shrieking at the tops of our lungs, but the ghost was nowhere to be seen. Some of the people still attending the trunk or treat ran over to check on us, and after verifying that no one was hurt, they sent us on our way. I haven't run across her again, but once a man crashed his tractor into a ditch over this ghost while I was in high school and there was almost constantly at least three accidents every year around the curves in the road, leaving drivers and passengers disoriented and asking about this mysterious woman. Now that I've moved across the city though, each time my fiancé and I visit my parents, I kind of expect that woman to appear in front of our car at some point. My fiancé thinks that I'm just telling spooky stories, but who knows, maybe one day she'll stop him and beg for help again. This happened almost a decade ago when I was 13 years old. I remember my friend and I were excited about our first time trick-or-treating without our parents, and we lived in a small town where nothing ever happens and so we thought that it would be the same that night. It started like any other Halloween night. We collected candy, ran into many of my classmates, and we had a lot of fun. At 8pm we realized that well, we had to head home, but on the way back we dropped by our teacher's house. She wasn't home and the street didn't have many street lights. But to add to this too, most of the houses had their lights turned off and their Halloween decorations were taken down. My friend and I were slightly spooked and disappointed by the lack of candy. We wanted to get out of the street as soon as we could, and that's when a man emerged from under one of the few street lights. But thankfully, it was a police officer. Neither of us seemed to notice him before this, possibly due to the darkness. He startled us, but seemed very friendly. The cop introduced himself and pointed to an inconspicuous bungalow. He said an older man living in this house was inviting trick-or-treaters inside. Someone called the police, but when he arrived, no one was answering the door. He kept telling us his police car and partner were just around the block. We looked around, but we couldn't see them. Now, I was a pretty paranoid kid when I was young. Growing up, my mum loved watching crime shows, and she would always tell me tidbits of lessons. One of these was a story about fake cops. Although I don't remember the details, I remembered people can pretend to be police officers to gain trust. But throughout this whole exchange too, I was just terrified for some reason. Maybe it was his lack of badge or police car and partner. Whatever it was though, it just didn't feel right. I was also conflicted because he was smiling and seemed like he just wanted to help. And that was until we heard his strange request. He said that he needed to speak to his potential predator and needed our help. 
and since we were young girls, the man would answer if we knocked. The officer claimed that he would hide behind the bushes next to the front door. He would wait for him to invite us in, jump out, and catch him red-handed. At that moment, I knew my friend felt the same way that I did. We both fell silent, but one of us managed to ask if we could discuss it. The cop said yes, but told us that we had limited time. The street was silent, and he could hear everything. I remember the feeling of wanting to say something, but fearing that he would hear us and escalate the situation. We just stared at each other for what felt like forever. The cop was getting increasingly impatient and told us that we had to decide quickly. Around that moment, a family came down the street and noticed the officer. They were coming over to see what was happening and that's when the cop said that he'd be right back and to not go anywhere. My friend and I scrambled to collect our thoughts and we ended up just deciding to run away quickly. We sprinted our way down the street and we didn't look back. On our way home, we discussed theories that ranged from him being a fake cop, him playing a prank on us, or him being a real cop, but we just misunderstood the situation. When we told our parents, we downplayed it a lot and doubted our experience. In the end, we didn't call the police, but our dads drove to the house and the area around the house, but no cop cars or police officers were anywhere in sight. Over the years, I can say that I do regret not calling the cops. At the time, my friend and I were just convinced that we misunderstood what happened. We even told our class the next day, and most, including our teacher, thought that it wasn't alarming. But looking back, I find it extremely strange that a police officer would put two children in such a potentially dangerous situation, moreover with their parents not present. I wonder what his motives really were, but unfortunately, that will probably remain unsolved. So I'm going to preface this by stating that the information I'm about to share with you guys is not fiction. It is, in fact, my complete and honest recollection of the unexplained experiences... I observed in and around the wooded area behind my childhood home. Other people in my family noted much of the same while growing up there, and our stories match now that we're all decades older. I'm not saying that I believe in skinwalkers, sasquatches, or any other cryptids, as I'm a man of science, but I cannot ignore the lack of reliable and testable evidence in regards to such creatures actually existing. That being said, something very terrifying and unexplained, lived or lives in the woods behind that house. So the first occurrence, my sister and I had just received a tent as a gift from our grandfather. He had smoked enough Marlboro cigarettes and sent in the UPCs to get us a massive Marlboro tent. My mum hated it, but we, however, loved it and immediately set it up on the property line behind the house. We intended on spending the night out there, but... After about an hour or so, we experience something neither of us can explain to this day. We saw an indentation drag itself across the tent and heard it dragging as it went. It was like a, a giant finger or maybe a log or something. Something of that size at least. My sister cried out and I immediately bolted outside as I was convinced that it was our father playing a prank on us. Upon exiting the tent, I was greeted by nothing. Though. There was nothing there. I searched the area briefly too before grabbing my sister and we went inside for the evening. About a week later, I ventured out to the tent again only to realize that it was gone. I ran inside and asked my mother where the tent was and she replied that she had thrown it away because it had tears in it. Confused, I tried to convince myself that she was lying and she had tossed it out because she was anti-smoking and thought the tent looked really trashy, but I fear that she was telling the truth. The second occurrence was one full morning, about an hour before my alarm went off for school. I was jolted out of bed by what I can only describe was a, an otherworldly shriek. 
It came from the woods, definitely. It didn't sound human, but it didn't sound quite animal either. Foxes and coyotes live in those woods, but they don't make those kinds of sounds. I can definitely tell the difference after living there for so long, but it was insanely loud too, and then it just stopped. And that was it. The third occurrence was one evening my father and I were up late having one of our classic all-night arguments. As we finally wrapped up our night around 3am, my father said that he wanted to read a verse from the Bible in order to close on a positive note of peace. As he began to read aloud, that same or at least very similar otherworldly shriek boomed throughout the house. It had to be just outside of the kitchen window, but it was so loud that it almost sounded like it was actually inside the house. But we immediately ran around the house trying to find what the heck had made such a sound, and it even woke my siblings and my mother up, who helped in the confused search. After about half an hour of searching, we eventually just all sort of gave up and went to bed scratching our heads. The fourth occurrence was in my senior year of high school. I actually got a cat around this time. She was an outside cat, but we would let her into the garage to sleep every night, mostly due to the coyotes and potentially bad weather and whatnot. She would always come home before we shut the garage doors, though, because she didn't want to be locked out. And one night, she just didn't show up. I didn't think too much of it, as cats are sometimes known to go on long hunting or mating excursions, only to return like two or three days later, like nothing even happened. And I... Just assumed that that was the case. But after not seeing her for like a week, I went and explored the area behind my house, the fields, and of course the woods, and I think that I found her. I say I think because I honestly couldn't tell. It looked like her, but she'd been seemingly just turned inside out. I stared at the remains for about a minute before turning back and just going home and after that I, I never did see her again if you can shed any light on what kind of animal or being or, or whatever you might think this is is then please don't hesitate to share or speculate my family especially myself I'll admit would really love to know what exactly was in those woods I'll start by saying that my family is no stranger to weird paranormal happenings. I may share more about those as I remember them fully, but this is meant to be more of a detailed explanation of a situation that I've shared previously. So I'll only be listing the things that I believe are related. During the winter of 2009, there was a big snowstorm that hit my small Oklahoma town. If you know how the southern states deal with snow, then you understand that this is a pretty big deal. The snowstorm knocked out the power off and on over the period of a, a few days, I think. And this instance happened when the storm first hit. So my brother, my girlfriend at the time, a couple of friends and I had pretty much been snowed in. The power was hanging in there at this point. I had made my daughter some chicken nuggets for dinner and she was sitting in her high chair just eating them. She had been eating for a few minutes when she sort of stiffened in a silent scream and stared onto the long hall that reached the length of my house. Instantly, the energy in the house had changed too. There was almost a, a buzzing in the air, if that's the right way to put it. But my friend, my brother and I jumped up and we put ourselves between the girls and whatever had scared my daughter like this. After she saw something, she thrashed her chicken nuggets off of the high chair, trying to get out, so my then girlfriend grabbed her and was now holding her. We could all feel something looking at us. We assumed maybe someone had walked through the back door at the end of the hall, but we couldn't see anything. Then my daughter started to scream, crying, at a man, over and over. Now, the friend that was there with us was actually a skeptic. He didn't believe in anything paranormal up until this incident. But the buzz in the air finally died down. We asked my daughter about what she saw, and the best that she could tell us through baby talk was that it looked like daddy with long wet hair like mummy. Obviously, it wasn't that clear, but I'm translating from a toddler, a little kid. But this was just the start. 
A few days later, my daughter started having nightmares about what she called the blue eyes. The best that we could gather was that uh, this was a, a group of kids and all she could see was their blue eyes. One night, I woke up from a deep sleep and I saw someone standing behind my fan. They were kind of hunched over, looking between the blades. Then I suddenly heard my daughter start crying at the top of her lungs. The figure quickly dusted away, and I use the word dusted because it was like the person just sort of came apart. Normally, I would assume that this was just a lucid dream or something, but my daughter happened to cry in the middle of it right at that point. I don't know. I jumped up to check on her, though, and as soon as she saw me, she said, the blue eyes made the baby on fire. And this was word for word, minus the baby talk. At this point, I reached out to a family friend. She made me a bag to sew into my daughter's teddy bear, and I did it. But my daughter's nightmare stopped, and we didn't have any more related incidents after that, too. Myself and the girlfriend broke up a few years later, and I moved to Texas and had some roommates, but only had visitation with my daughter. Nothing that happened ever seemed as if it was related to the earlier incidences, so I pretty much forgot about it. In this house in Texas, I started having issues with sleep paralysis, though. I would occasionally wake up and see a big pair of chattering teeth in my closet and wouldn't be able to move. Eventually, I would always doze back off, but it was freaky. I've told other people before that at first, I never thought that it bothered my stepson, but upon speaking about it to my wife last night, she thinks that it may have. A few years after the sleep paralysis, my wife and my stepson came into my life. My stepson would often have nightmares, but one night he complained of being scared to sleep. This is normal because he's only three, but we asked him why and he told us there are scary teeth in my closet. Now, I know not necessarily related, but I thought that it was worth mentioning. Years after that, though, we now have a three-year-old girl. She's very smart and advanced, and pretty fast with her speech, so she was pretty much understandable just before her second birthday. And she has always had issues with sleep. She started telling her things about a baby scaring her when she was sleeping. A little while later, she started talking to us about random things. And one day, she's riding in a car seat, and she tells us that she saw me last night, but... I was apparently a spirit. She starts referring to this spirit as Spirit Daddy. And apparently she follows Spirit Daddy around the house as he and his friends with blue eyes go into each of her siblings' rooms and jump and play. They crawl on the walls and play on the beds, then go to the next room and do the same thing. And then they run and hide until next time. So, the two of my children have described me as... Some kind of a spirit with long hair coming and interacting with them. The spirit daddy also apparently has friends that have blue eyes and are kids. But for the record too, this isn't like a family legend that we talk about or anything. After the first occurrence, there was a kind of hush order on the Adam man. We just didn't want repeats or for the kids to have nightmares when they were older. So, if you've made it this far, then thanks for listening and... I don't know. I just wanted to see what everyone thinks about my case now that it's happening again. Maybe you can help me figure it out. What it is, that is. Anyway, thanks for listening and hopefully I can figure this out soon. So I work at San Diego CA International Airport. I fuel aircraft and do a lot of doubles and overtime, so... Most of the time I'm working. Here's why this is relevant too. I work night shift and I live about 120 miles away so when I'm not working I'm usually on the road. I commute a lot so by now I'm pretty familiar with my route. There's this particular spot though where if I need to take a leak I can exit the freeway and be out of sight for the rest of the traffic. This spot is about an hour into my drive up in the mountains there's nothing around for miles, but my highway patrol or border patrol station somewhere in the mountain, since the border is south, just a few miles in. And so, I exited my vehicle, turned off the engine, and I killed the lights, and went on my business, and when I was done, I thought that I heard footsteps nearby, but 
It was so dark and foggy that I could just barely make out a figure. With the occasional passing by of a vehicle on the freeway, it's very quiet, so I hop in my car and start the engine, and I switch the lights on purposely steering in the direction of the figure to light it up. And when I get there, it looks like a young girl dressed in black, loose long black hair pushing a stroller in very short and slow steps, and she's coming from a, a rugged and small dirt road that I'm pretty sure only border patrol trucks use since it leads to the mountain, but from where I am, I could see the long little road all the way into the mountains where it makes a turn behind a boulder. I'm about 10 feet away, and so I lower the window with the intention to ask if she's okay. I mean, it's 1am, super cold. I'm advancing slowly at this point, and I'm pretty close, but I'm trying to see inside the stroller, and I see two small hands moving, just like when a baby is playing with its hands in the air. But here... It's where the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up because I hear grunting, pig-like grunting, coming from the stroller. And now that I look at her, there's no freaking face. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, and I remember I exclaimed out loud, nope, steered the other way and just drove towards the freeway. All this happened in the span of about 20 or 30 seconds, and all I know is that... I'm never going to stop there again. I've always been afraid of the dark. More than that, in fact, I've always been afraid of the curtains being open at night. The big black void of the backyard from the kitchen window is just unnerving, so I make it a point to close the curtains before nightfall. That said, the first incident happened about a week and a half ago. Now, our neighbours across the street had had a lot of company lately, so the sound of car doors and people talking and stuff like that had been a common thing the past few weeks. They'd only lived there for about two months, and since they moved in, lots of people were coming and going. However, this usually stopped when it started to get dark, at least on most nights anyway. So when I started hearing sounds akin to doors opening and closing outside, I got a little bit nervous. I started thinking that maybe the neighbors just had a random night visit from someone. Some people do, I guess. I mean, I do sometimes. So I kind of put it out of my mind. I just continued watching videos with my husband. After about an hour, he fell asleep and I kind of rested my head on his shoulder, still watching videos. Until our dog, Penny, rose her head up and started growling. This dog is a master alarm, and I mean, any time she hears something outside that doesn't seem right, mostly just at people showing up unexpectedly, or people talking outside, or stuff like that, she'll perk up and growl or bark. Whenever she does, I go on high alert, especially at night. Our other dog, Clementine, isn't so quick to be aggressive. She's still a pup, only seven months old. She had no reaction to this except to sit up and try and play with Penny while she swerved away from her, ears and tail pointing straight up and alert. I immediately lifted myself up from my husband's shoulder though and I got out of bed. I should note that for the past couple of weeks, we slept in the living room as we're having our bedroom and bathroom renovated on. Our mattress is on the floor between the couches and just behind us is a small hall that leads to the laundry room and one of the two back doors in the house. On this back door is a window with a small white curtain, and I hate that door. The curtain on it is very see-through, and I try my best to avoid it at night, but as it's the most readily available window, it was the one that I went to check and see what Penny was barking at. When all I saw was darkness, I checked the front windows and saw nothing. After a while, Penny calmed down and took her place at the foot of the bed next to the couch, Clementine, too, took her place sleeping in the front of the windows behind the couch that's in front of our bed. I put it out of my mind, thinking that maybe she was just having a senior moment. She is 12 years old, and she's had moments where she's just barked at nothing before. When I heard the sound of rustling just outside of the back door behind me. Outside, there's a lot of tools, a workbench, and a couple of old washers that we took out of the shed not long ago to try and get rid of. There's also some lawn chairs that make a very distinct sound when pushed across the concrete patio. And this is the sound that I heard. 
I know this sound because when the dogs are outside, Clementine runs into them and even drags them around a lot. So much so that I'll sometimes just stack them in the shed to avoid it. Penny immediately starts growling again and even barking a couple of times, stirring my husband. I was frozen and didn't want to get up and check, so I shook my husband and told him what I'd heard. Both of us got up and checked the back door window by us, and the large picture window in the kitchen, as well as the window in the back door in there. Eventually, he resorted to grabbing a crowbar from the tool closet inside and peeking at the kitchen back door. There was nothing there. He sighed and told me that it was probably just the wind blowing those chairs around. They weren't exactly heavy, just those cheap white plastic ones some people have, and it actually was kind of windy that night too. But I still couldn't just shake the feeling that that wasn't it. Cut to two nights later though. It was a Friday night and my husband had gone out with a work friend. I was alone browsing on my laptop when all of a sudden I heard that rustling again. Only this time it wasn't just the sound of the lawn chairs in the patio. This time it sounded like someone was actually in the shed. The laundry room behind connects directly to the shed, which is actually a small carport or garage type room that we just store all of our excess belongings in. So anytime a sound is made there, if you're in the living room, you can actually hear it quite clearly. This time, not only Penny began growling, but even Clementine, who never growls, began to follow suit. And this made me nervous. I called my husband and told him that I heard something in the shed and he immediately told me that he'd head home straight away and to keep the doors locked. I ran to each door, making sure that they were all locked. When I passed the kitchen, I caught a glance at the picture window in the kitchen and I'd forgotten to close the curtains so they were open in the darkness of the backyard. Against the dim glow of the light in the alley behind the fence, I saw something move. I froze because I had no idea what to do. I didn't know how long it would be before my husband got home and I didn't want to go near the window to shut the curtains for fear of whoever was out there seeing me. So I hid behind the corner by the kitchen with Penny and Clementine at my legs as though guarding me, both still growling. I clutched my phone to my chest, trying to remember if the back door by the kitchen was locked or not. I ultimately decided that I could easily crawl through the other opening to the kitchen without being detected as it was out of the way of the window and led straight to the back door. I got on my hands and knees and slowly crept my way to the opening and at least from there I could clearly see the lock and maybe wouldn't have to go all the way to it at all. And this was by far my biggest mistake or possibly my saving grace. The front door window has a clear view of where I was and it just didn't occur to me until I heard the security knob jiggle. I froze and snapped my head to face the front door window. In the light of the porch light, I could clearly see someone peering in at me. If it was my husband, he would have just come in straight away. But instead, whoever it was, just stared. I couldn't see their face as the security kind of blurs the image through the window, but either way, I could tell that... It wasn't my husband. I didn't think. I just dashed down the hall into our bedroom. Messy though it was with the wood and the paint cans and the rolled up carpet all over the place. I knew that I could at least hide in the ensuite bathroom and lock the door. While also locking the bedroom door behind me of course. I immediately called the police who made me stay with them on the line while they sent an officer out. My husband got home first practically scaring the crap out of me when he knocked on the bedroom door. I came out of the bedroom and unlocked the door and threw my arms around him. And not long after that, the police came. But there was no sign of anyone outside or even in the alleyway. I didn't sleep at all that night and neither did my husband. He just kind of laid there with a the crowbar next to him and our dogs were restless too. Heads and ears constantly perked up, peering around like they were listening for any indication of an intruder. Cut again to two nights ago though and after the whole thing with the police I had a hard time sleeping so I've pretty much ruined my sleep schedule by staying up until my eyes could literally not handle being open anymore and that night I was watching a movie trying to focus on pleasant happy films to put my mind at ease when without warning Penny began howling and barking viciously with her head stuck between the curtains of the windows behind the couch that's in front of the bed and my blood ran cold. 
I stood up to peek outside, and the neighbours across the street were all standing in the yard, talking quite loud, but something just didn't seem right. They all seemed to be looking in my direction, and Penny was not letting up. She was barking so viciously, I almost didn't recognise her. I mean, I've never seen her so worked up. I couldn't get her to stop no matter what I did, so I eventually just pulled her from the window. But she wouldn't have it. She jumped on the chair and shoved her head between the curtains of the window by the front door and just continued. My husband woke up and instantly went into protective man of the house mode. He grabbed the crowbar from the floor beside him, walked over to the window and looked out to see what she was barking at, telling me to stay behind him. And when all that he saw was the neighbours, he got a little bit irritated by this. He'd been as stressed as I was since the whole police incident and was finally getting some decent rest. But still, despite what it may have appeared to be, I told him maybe that we should call the police again. Seeing Penny that way just left me really uneasy. The whole situation just seemed off. At first, he was reluctant, saying that they wouldn't do anything if nothing had ever happened. But as he said this, he just went paper white and his eyes burned into the picture window in the kitchen behind me. I turned around and saw three figures climbing over the fence into the alleyway out of our yard. I immediately called the cops again, and my husband tore out the back door while I begged him to stay inside. I mean, I didn't know if those guys had a gun or what, while all we had was the crowbar. The police were there in seconds, it seemed. Fast for them, to be honest, around here. And luckily, they caught up with all three guys, who ratted out my across-the-street neighbors. Apparently, according to the officer that we spoke to, these people had warrants out for their arrest on multiple offenses. One was wanted for possession of drugs with the intent to sell. Two of the other guys had outstanding warrants for assault, while the girl that lived with them was wanted in the next state over for armed robbery. Which meant that it was truly a den of criminals. Apparently they'd been watching us as well as our neighbours to the left and right, figuring out our schedules for when things go quiet or when we're at work, trying to find a good time to break in and just steal any valuables. Yesterday I spoke with the neighbour on the left. She's a very nice lady and she's lived next to my family for the past 14 years. She told me that she thought that she heard someone breaking into a home a couple of weeks prior and immediately installed a security system. I can't help but think that this must have deterred them from her, so they may have moved on to try and rob us. Our other neighbour luckily hasn't had any trouble, which kind of makes me nervous though when I think about it. It's been quiet since though, and the house across the street was pretty much searched, and the rental company emptied it out this morning. It's just eerily dark over there though, which gives me the spooks. While I've always had a weird fear of opening windows at night, I'm kind of grateful that I forgot to close the curtains that first night. If I hadn't have seen that first guy in the backyard, maybe I wouldn't have tried to crawl to the kitchen door and notice the one at my front door. And if we had closed the curtains on the night that they all got caught, maybe my husband wouldn't have seen them all in the backyard, either. Either way, I'm just glad it's all over and no one was hurt in the end. I feel a lot safer now and just maybe I'll finally be able to get some sleep. This happened when I was 19 or 20. I'm 31 now, rarely drink or go out anymore, but last weekend a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in a couple of years asked me out, and we ended up going to a club on the street where this story takes place, and the whole thing just reminded me of it. So legal drinking age in Brazil is 18, and people here start partying pretty early, and let's face it, no one really knows their limits when they start drinking, right? My friends and I had gone to this club. I honestly can't remember the name right now, but I know it closed down a couple of years back. And we had a great time, and the sun was coming up as we were leaving. Most clubs here give you a credit card when you walk in, where you either put in the money you plan on spending, or they work as a personal digital tab where bartenders add up what you're drinking and whatnot, and you pay for it on the way out. I pay for my stuff, and I sit outside to wait for my friends who are taking a long time to get out, Probably due to just being drunk as hell. As I'm sitting there though, I notice a car across the street. Two dudes in the front seats. One out of the car trying to make this clearly drunk out of her mind girl get inside as well. 
She's mumbling and stumbling, struggling to keep her eyes open, and she's saying no, I don't want to go, over and over, shaking her head, clinging onto the car door as the guy keeps telling her to let go and get inside, that they're just going to a friend's apartment to drink some more, it'll be fun, come on. I watch on, wondering if I should do something, if no one else is seeing this happening. I look at the club security guard, he looks at me and he shrugs, like it's not his responsibility. I look back at the girl and I'm really uncomfortable but also scared. My friends are still nowhere to be seen, I'm alone. The security guard is clearly not going to do anything and there's three of the guys there. And what if they decide to try and get me as well? The girl says one more time that she doesn't want to go with them. And before I realize what I'm doing, I'm getting to my feet and shouting, hey. The guy stops trying to push the girl into the car for a moment and looks at me. I say, she said she didn't want to go, dude. I start making my way across the street, even though my hands are shaking and my voice is probably not the most convincing. They say, she's our friend, she's just drunk and pretty cranky. It's all good and we're just going to take her home. He seems a bit nervous and not exactly angry, which makes me feel a bit better or less scared at least. Do you know them? I ask her and she just shakes her head no, using the door as support to keep herself on her feet. Creep 1, the one who was trying to push her in the car, looks at me and to his friends who seem frustrated, but starts saying, come on man, let's just go, let's leave it. Creep 1, now looking a bit pissed, grabs the girl and pushes her towards me, getting in the car and they all leave. The girl nearly falls on her face, but I grab her and we walk back to the front of the club, my heart slowly going back to its normal rate. Only then do I realize that my friends had come out and were watching everything from across the street with confused faces. We all meet random people at clubs, at the door, walking down the street, so they probably thought that I'd met someone. I start asking her what had happened, if she's alone, where's all of her stuff, and she's just an incoherent mess, mumbling about losing track of her friends, her purse, she doesn't even know how she paid her tab to leave or anything. I ask for some help to the security guard, but he says that he can't leave his spot and he can't do anything. I explain what happened to my friends and they talk to the hostess about it, who begrudgingly goes and checks the lost and found. Her purse is thankfully there, minus the money that she had in her wallet, and we manage to call her parents as well. I talk to her mum because the girl can't explain anything and I promise to stay there until the mum comes to get her. 30 minutes later, the mum arrives and... I've never seen someone look so relieved and terrified at the same time. She thanks me and my friends as well profusely and offers us a ride home, but as we live the next town over, she just drives us to the subway station. In the middle of all the craziness, I forgot to exchange numbers with any of them, so I've never heard from that girl or her mum again, but I hope she learned to be more careful with just how much she drinks or who she talks to in clubs. Also, shame on her friends for not looking out for her or trying to find her when they realized that she was missing. Though, maybe they were all just as drunk as her. Who knows? I know what I did was probably reckless. But quite honestly, I wouldn't be able to just watch that car drive away and live with myself anymore. Please be safe when going out, guys. To preface this story, I am a bit of a skeptic when it comes to the paranormal and stuff like this, but I am open-minded too. I always look for the rational explanation for odd things, like most people do, I suppose, but like I said, I, I am open-minded. My husband and I, though, we live on a farm of about 100 acres and we raise cattle. It's a family farm. My dad grew up here and my grandpa lived and worked this land until the day that he died which means that I'm familiar with every inch and have never felt scared walking the farm or the surrounding land. But a few months ago, one of our cattle disappeared. She had a calf, and if you're familiar with cattle, it's pretty strange for a cow to leave her calf, depending on the cow, of course, but our farm is in the Appalachian foothills in Kentucky, so there's quite a few hollers. We just figured that the cow went down into a holler, died in the brush somewhere, or got out into a neighbor's field or something. My husband looked and looked, but never actually found her, never even found a body, never found any evidence of that cow, in fact. 
But the day that she went missing, there were some strange spots in the grass of the field where it was all laid down like something had smushed it, and oddly enough, two vehicles ran out of gas right near those weird spots. I thought it was just a, a weird spooky coincidence, like a haha very funny moment, oh the supernatural, until today that is. Because today my favorite cow went missing. My husband, sister and I spent approximately five hours searching for this cow too. We combed every inch of those fields, we searched the hollers, we checked the neighbor's fields, but there was no sign of her anywhere. She also had a calf too and was a notoriously good mum and the calf is still here. I figured that she got out into a neighboring cornfield or perhaps someone stole her, which would have been weird because she was an older cow and was the only missing cow until I experienced the strangest thing that makes me think that maybe this is all supernatural. You see... My sister and I were out looking for the missing cow around 6.30 or 7. And between two of our fields, there's a piece of land that we don't actually own that sort of just between two of the fields that we do own. It's mostly wooded and bordered with a barbed wire fence. I knew our cows sometimes crossed over, so I wanted to search in there. My sister and I are both in our late 20s and grew up running wild in the woods. We hunted, climbed waterfalls, dodged snakes, pulled ticks off ourselves. Nothing scared us then and pretty much nothing scares us now. So I crossed over this barbed wire to go look for this cow and my sister stopped. Which is weird because she's my younger sister and always follows me. I was teasing her, calling her a chicken and telling her that I'd been here before and that I wouldn't take her anywhere dangerous and that she knows that. But she just kept stalling and... I finally got short with her and yelled at her to come on. She crossed the barbed wire but kept stopping and finally she caught up to me but as I walked further into the woods I just got a really bad feeling all of a sudden. The only way that I can really describe it is dark and also my sister said that she couldn't hear me even though I was talking loudly and I was only like two feet away from her at the most. But I finally stopped, turned around and... We just booked it out of there. Once we crossed back over the barbed wire, that bad feeling just instantly left me. My sister went home a couple of hours later because she was unusually tired. I texted her and asked her if she thought that the woods felt off and she says that she was terrified the entire time. This is what she wrote in the text. It was like we were going down a dark path to nowhere. I like to explore but I didn't feel right. It gives me chills and almost makes me cry thinking about it, so I just told myself that I was psyching myself out. And it was right when we passed the fence, it felt like we were somewhere where we shouldn't have been. I was actually scared. I trust you and everything of course, but the feeling that I got standing looking into the woods was just telling me not to go, not to cross the fence. And the farther we went, the worse it got. Like a, a dark shadow or something screaming at me inside, telling me to go back. Afterwards, I also got a heavy feeling, making me so tired. This all happened this evening too, and we never did find that cow or any sign of her. I also have this horrible lingering feeling from being in those woods. I feel dread when I think about it. I'm exhausted and I'm jumpy too. I wanted to recount this story somewhere too so that I wouldn't forget the details and to see if anyone else has had any similar experiences or thoughts on what might be happening here, supernatural or otherwise. I can tell you though that I've never felt anything like that in my entire life and my sister is never scared, which I think is probably what scared me the most. I'm a 27 year old female and I graduated from high school about 10 years ago. In my freshman year of high school I was well known and had lots of friends. I was very friendly and every time that I saw somebody alone I would greet them and offer them my friendship. Sometime during the year in my math class we had a new guy come in. Jose had recently moved to the US from Mexico. He knew hardly any English but me being Hispanic I was able to speak to him in Spanish and make him feel very welcome. 
Jose, though, he had no friends and always just sat by himself, which was kind of sad. In that math class, though, I started helping out Jose a lot. He sat behind me and he would always play with my hair. Not actually head, but my hair, so I could hardly feel it. I sort of felt like he had a crush on me and he wasn't bad looking, so I didn't look at it as a, a big deal. For a few months, two or three months, he played with my hair though and it became a bit of a norm. He said that he actually really liked my hair and towards the end of those months he said that he wanted to play a game and asked me to write the things that I loved the most in life. He would do the same and we would both share papers. Of course I wrote down my family, God, friends and a whole bunch of other things. When I gave him back the list he wanted specific names and he said that he would do the same. I ended up writing my friends and family's names. Now one day we were just hanging out in class and Jose said, can I show you something? But you can't tell anybody else or you're going to have to pay for it. I was really confused to be honest. I thought maybe that he wanted to ask me out or something. But Jose pulled out a Ziploc bag and I couldn't really tell what was in the bag. It wasn't until he placed it in the table and I noticed that it was a Ziploc bag full of hair. My hair, he said. Jose pulled up his sleeve and showed his arm. He had about 10 heels knife scars, lines made with the blade of the knife, that went right down his entire arm. There was a fresh knife wound too, and he grabbed onto my hairs and placed it on the top of the freshly opened wound from the night before and said, You're mine now. I know who you love, what you love. If you don't do as I say, you'll pay for everything. These are all the scars and these are all the souls that I own. Anything and everything that happens from now on, think of me. And at that, well, my heart sank and I was totally creeped out. He started smirking, but I ran out of the class crying and ran to the office. Everyone was obviously really confused. I asked to speak to my counselor immediately. I explained what had happened. Jose was pulled out of class, taken to the principal's office, and was expelled that day. I feared for my life and they found all of these notes of other people in his backpack and mine was there too. They saw the scars and they also found my hair so that confirmed everything. After that I never heard from Jose again. I've had some pretty messed up stuff happen in my life after that I'll admit but I always thought of Jose whenever it happened. I haven't talked about this in like 10 years I'm afraid that if I mention this that he'll hear me and more bad news will follow. I know, kind of silly, but still, it's just how I feel. I got really close with God after this though, closer than ever, and until this day I don't know if Jose was just messing with me, but I'll tell you that after that encounter I am no longer the super friendly and open hearted person that I used to be. So I grew up in a provincial town somewhere north of the Philippines. Back in the mid-90s, my mum had an instrumental job of helping establish schools in poorer provincial areas of the country. This was during the early days of cell phones too, and a lot of the areas didn't even have electricity, much less telephones, so getting contacts wasn't as simple as it is today. They needed people to actually travel from one town to another to bridge the gaps. My dad also had a farm about 30 minutes to an hour away, so they'd usually take the opportunity to check on it during one of the business trips. Now, the provincial roads that they had to traverse were dark and dimly lit with sharp turns, and stories of collisions and accidents taking place at the dead of night were definitely not uncommon. One of the most infamous sites in the region was a bridge in a town that I'm not going to specify that had allegedly collapsed and been rebuilt after a fully loaded bus was trying to pass a few decades before. There'd been myths of witnessing bloody and bruised people looking into vehicles of passerbys, but I personally never saw anything in the many times that I've passed through that bridge, so I thought that it was all hogwash. But my mum told me this story once, and I've never forgot it. So... In one of their trips, my mum had two of her co-workers along. They'd finished their business trip and were on their way back home, and at about 1am they were still up chatting about random things, trying to keep my dad on the wheel awake. They were nearing the bridge when, from far away, they could see what looked to be a woman with frizzy hair and ripped and tattered rags that looked like it had once been beautiful, 
maybe a white dress, standing on the side of the bridge, looking off into the distance. My dad described her skirt as torn and flaring in the wind. One of my mum's co-workers said, Wait, is that a person? Wondering what a woman would be doing there in the middle of the night like that. This person, they might have intended to jump and this must have been a cry for help or something is what they assumed. But as they got closer, my dad slowed the car down to see what was up with this woman and when they were next to her, she suddenly turned around, looked right at them and gave them a smile. Her teeth were white, but my dad said that from the tip of her nose, the upper part of her face, there was just nothing there. I asked my dad to clarify, a little bit confused by this, suggesting that maybe her hair was obscuring the top part of her face so they couldn't see her eyes, but he and my mum swear that they know what they saw. There was just a black, empty void where the rest of that woman's face should have been. Everyone in the car was freaking out at this point, obviously, and my dad just hit it and didn't stop until they got to the next town. After everyone had calmed down a bit, my mum's co-workers suggested that they started praying, so they did. They prayed that they would be safe that night and not encounter anything else. Thankfully, too, they all got home safely that night, but since that day, my mum's co-workers have been pretty reluctant to tag along in these road trips. Even today, whenever I ask my dad to tell me the story again, he's still visibly shaken and getting goosebumps sometimes. Over the years, I've heard a couple of road trip stories from friends, and if you ever talk to anyone who's been in these trips, chances are that they have a story to tell. I have a few more of these, including one that I've personally taken place in other towns, but I'll leave this for some other time because, well, I gotta get back to it. So one night I was in my bed with my boyfriend. It was about 1.30 in the morning and I get a text from a random number saying, is this my name? Sorry for messaging late and out of the blue like this, but I don't think my boyfriend's name is being honest with me and I need to talk to you. We exchange a few texts and basically they're accusing my boyfriend of cheating on the both of us. Obviously I was annoyed, but bear in mind it was like June of 2020, bang in the middle of coronavirus lockdown in the UK, and we'd spent every day together since March. He denied it all, obviously, and insisted that he didn't know who this person was. The same number starts texting me too, angry texts, calling him a lying rat and stuff like that, not looking good for the boyfriend, that's for sure. But this is where it gets really weird, because you see, this person gives no specifics. They won't tell me their name, what my boyfriend has done, only that he was a liar and that I was an idiot for believing him. I'd ask, but they would just reply vague, angry texts. Their grammar and spelling was good, but they'd use slang words from like our local area and stuff, so they must have been from around here. We assumed that maybe it was some kids who found our numbers off of Facebook and were having a laugh, so we just tried to ignore it in the end. Then, nothing. Until my boyfriend gets a text the following afternoon asking him to meet them at a local social club for some company. Me and a friend got straight in the car and we went down there. Nobody was there and the club was closed because of COVID, but we couldn't help feel like we were being watched. It was really weird. A few days go by though when the same number starts texting me again. This time the text language is all weird, like spelling mistakes and saying why you too instead of you too spelled the right way. That kind of thing. And it felt like it was a different person texting me to be honest. But they seem a, a lot angrier with me now because I didn't believe them straight away. And then they text me, you're so dull. I see him leaving your house earlier, LMAO. Cocky, I know, but I said something like, funny, that's where my house is then, and they reply with my street name, which blew my mind. They also knew things about us, like the fact that he was in the army, but I guess you can figure out from his social media photos that that's possible. I don't know, but it was weird. I called them loads, but it would just ring twice and cut off. Tried searching the number on WhatsApp and on a few social media sites, but there was nothing there too. Only on Instagram the number would come up with a location of a film company in the Netherlands. 
But when I would Google the number, its provider is Tizmi, and uh, I've never heard of it, but it looks like it might just be a fake number. They've never asked for any money or anything like that either. But, I don't know, the whole thing is just really sketchy and weird. I really just don't get why someone would go through so much effort just to wind someone up like this. The last text that I got too was, Okay, you'll eventually see LMAO. Which is really creepy and I'm wondering, do any of you guys have any advice? So I was at a concert of my co-worker that time, and it wasn't really good, and at a church in a small town, 40 minutes away by car from the town that I lived. And when it was over, I found out that I missed my last bus. I asked my co-worker if I could sleep at his place, but he rejected it. So, I did what I always do in such a situation. I walked. It was the time before smartphones, so the only way for me to find the right path was by reading the street signs and hope for the best. I'll also admit that uh, I cried the entire time while I was walking. It was two in the morning though when I arrived at the next train station. I thought that I could take a ride with a cab but there were no cabs. I didn't know what to do so I waited at the place where the cab should be and I smoked a cigarette. Should I walk the way home? Another hour by foot or even more at least. Should I wait until a cab shows up or the first train in the morning? I didn't know what to do. But then... A car showed up and stopped in front of me. The man inside rolled down the passenger window and spoke to me. Hey, can you give me a light please? He said. I wasn't comfortable at all going over to him, but I did. I gave him a light and quickly turned around and stood at the same place as before. He didn't drive away though and asked where I had to go and I said in which town that I lived and he invited me to get into his car. He said that it was on the way and he could bring me home. After thinking about it for some time too, I really just don't know why I even got in the car. I didn't even want to, but I guess I was tired. The ride itself wasn't bad at all. We had a bit of small talk and he drove the usual route that I knew and he wasn't creepy at all while driving. And I thought maybe he was just really a nice guy, just trying to help me out. So I guided him to my house, but he didn't stop in front of it. Instead, he drove a bit further away. I thanked him and gave him my lighter as a gift, and when I was about to open the door and leave the car, he said, what the hell is wrong with you? I was surprised by this sudden mood change, and I asked, caught off guard, what? I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something along the lines of, that's not how you thank someone who drove you home in the middle of the night. I expect you to do another favor for me in return. Something like that anyway. I kind of understood what he implied, but... Well, I'm no hooker, so I chuckled a little bit, thanked him again, gave him the lighter, and I got out of the car. I was walking towards my home too, when I heard him opening the door and closing it, the door of his car that is, and then the sound of him running towards me. I looked over my shoulder and saw him getting closer to me. I shrieked, kind of like a mouse, and I started running as well. At the door of my home, I quickly opened it, got inside, locked it, ran upstairs to my bedroom, locked my door as well and just hid under my blanket. I got away and nothing else happened that night. He didn't do anything else. And he left and after that, I never saw him again. So my friend in the neighborhood found a Ouija board in his brother's stuff while he was away at college. He told me what it was and asked me if I wanted to play it with him. Trying to impress him, I said yes, and we went into his room and we tried it out. But nothing happened, and we were left pretty disappointed. But later that week, he called me and told me that he looked up how to use the board properly and wanted to give it another go. I agreed, as I was pretty confident nothing would happen again. So we grabbed a bunch of scented candles, and we placed them around the board and did the whole seance stuff. We asked the board if anyone was there, and it, of course, went to yes. We thought the other was messing around, but we agreed to take it seriously because I didn't really care if it was just a stupid joke. But we asked the ghost what its name was, and it spelled out Owen. My friend asked if it was a person, and it went to no. We asked what it was, and it actually spelled out demon. I then asked for it to prove it, and you know that call into the intro to Finding Bigfoot? 
Well, that's the closest thing to what we heard from the garage. But keep in mind, it was only us in the house and it scared the absolute crap out of us and we just ran straight out of the house. We also checked the garage after a while, but there was nothing. Anyway, a few weeks go by and he tells me how he's having paranormal experiences in his house. He feels like he's being watched whenever he's downstairs in the kitchen in the living room. He feels someone sitting on the end of his bed every night. And every time that he walks past the garage, he feels someone grab his wrist and pull it towards the garage. Whenever I went over, I always got that feeling that someone was looking at me from the ceiling. It was definitely weird and unnatural. But then came the scariest part of all. So we were at his house playing army in his room while no one else was home when we began to hear these heavy footsteps downstairs. Except whatever was making it obviously had hooves or something. In fact, it sounded like a full-grown horse was walking around downstairs. Then, we heard someone begin to laugh and cough at the same time. And my friend ran over and slammed the door shut and we hit. He hid under his bed while I hid in the closet. But then, it sounded like someone began scratching his door with like one big claw or something. He started crying and I was honestly on the verge of tears as well. My friend yelled, leave us alone Owen, you're scaring us and... It began to stop, and then we heard it run down the stairs. My friend got up and threw me out of the closet, and grabbed the Ouija board that was in there with me. He ran down the stairs, ripped the screen door off of his gas fireplace, threw the thing in there, put the screen back on, and went to turn it on. But when he was just about to turn it on, we heard a, a loud moan from the basement, which was right behind my friend. He flicked the fireplace on, and the board began to burn. And that was pretty much the end of it, and we just played outside since he was way too scared to go back into the house until his parents got home. His parents came home and saw that he'd burned his brother's Ouija board. They grounded him and threw the burnt board away. But after that, there was no more paranormal experiences in my friend's house anymore. But if anyone ever asks me to join in on a seance or with Ouija boards ever again, that's exactly why I will never take part in any of these games ever again. So I, a 21 female, used to live in a really bad neighborhood when I was a kid. Drive-by shootings were not uncommon, rapes had happened in surrounding houses while we lived there, and before we moved, we also found out that the sweet man across the street was actually a certified sex offender. So, obviously, not a great place for children to walk around alone, right? True, but if you have a 70 pound good boy that is completely dedicated to protecting you, it's doable. So, my mum, little brother in his stroller, me and Spanky, my good boy, went for a walk around the neighbourhood to go two blocks away to go to the community pool. I, like most six-year-olds, wanted to wander ahead with my dog because he was always gentle when I had the lead and walked closely to me. As we were nearing the pool, there was a stretch of hedges that lined the walkway to the pool entrance. Spanky was walking ahead of me by maybe about three feet. He sniffed towards a bush and just came to a complete stop. He began posturing and growling deeply, baring his teeth to the bush. He had never growled like this before and to me, it was kind of horrifying to see my best bud like this. I tried to walk around him and... He turned the back end of his body to block me, his eyes still fixed on the bush. I tried again and he does it yet again and my mum is still about four houses behind and hasn't noticed this yet. But then I see the bush start to move and take a step back. I say to my mum, mum I think Spanky found a kitty. I start taking a step towards the bush and am knocked over completely by Spanky at this point. I'm crying and on the ground, scraped elbow, no biggie but it definitely gets my mum running. And exactly at this moment, a man bolts out from the bush and takes off running. But when Spanky knocked me over, it made me drop his leash so he booked it after this guy. About 300 feet away from the bush, Spanky caught up with him and made some sickening contact with this guy's ankles and forearms. Now, I've heard a lot of screams on TV and in movies but... I had never heard a real blood-curdling scream like this before. My mum pulled me close and pulled out her phone, fingers shaking. 
but while she's on the phone with 911, you can hear this guy screaming, get him off me, and me going, Spanky, he's not a kitty. Spanky may have actually mangled a stray cat who wandered into the yard before this, just FYI. But when the police arrived, they asked for a full version of events, and my mum and I gave the details the best that we could. Spanky was sitting contently at our feet after the officers and my mum removed Spanky from this guy. The guy was taken in cuffs and after a quick checkup by the ambulance, he was fine, just a few good bites. Spanky definitely held back somewhat. But about 10 years later, I asked my mother about it when I was looking through old photo albums and saw a picture of me and Spanky playing in the backyard. She sighed and said, Oh, you know what happened, we don't need to talk about it. I said, well, yeah, but why would he attack some random homeless guy? And my mum made a really confused face, and I said, What? That's what happened, right? She then says, I guess I can tell you now. I didn't want to tell you back then because I didn't want you to worry. But the man who Spanky pulled out of that bush had been spotted peeking into the houses in the neighborhood that had kids. He was the same man that was hiding in the backyard when you had a sleepover at your friend's house. He had a knife that he dropped when he ran from the bush. And the police thought that he might have been canvassing the neighborhood before he decided who to take, and if it wasn't for Spanky, you might have actually have been you. So yeah, basically, this guy was a complete pedophile that had been spending weeks at night creeping into people's backyards that he knew had children, so that he could break into our rooms individually, and kidnap us, and most likely, much worse. I live 300 miles from there now, and still to this day... I cannot handle coming to that stupid hedge, even if I try. So like I mentioned in my previous story, my boxer actually saved me from almost being kidnapped by someone who scouted us out. And there was a pedophile in the neighborhood who was looking for his chance to strike, but my boy stopped him before he could. But... This is actually what led up to this happening, just one week beforehand. So like I said in the other story, this was a really bad neighborhood, but it was also full of families with young kids, and most of us in the neighborhood were around the same age and liked to play together. One of my friends was a little girl called Alexis, and we were both six years old. We lived right across the street from one another, and we played often when our older sisters who were friends would play too. Most of the time we played in the street, our front yards, or either one of our houses. We also had semi-weekly sleepovers after I had ballet and she had t-ball. But for this particular sleepover, it was Alexis's birthday, so we went door-to-door -door in the neighborhood and handed out handmade invitations to the Big Seven sleepover. We went to about six or seven houses, I'd say, to rally our friends and about eight little girls in total attended. That night too, her mum let us set up our sleeping bags in the living room, right next to the sliding glass door that led out to the backyard. This was on the opposite side of the house from her mum's room, but we all insisted on sleeping there, and she obliged in the end because she had work the next evening and just wanted to get some sleep. So, we were all playing hide and go seek in the living room and the kitchen when Alexa's big sister suggested that we turn off the lights and play in the dark instead. I, afraid of the dark and still used a nightlight religiously, said no, but was quickly outvoted. We were playing for about five minutes, and when I was hiding next to the sliding glass door behind the curtain, I was getting bored and decided to look outside. I look outside, and I see this big-ass oak tree in the backyard, and I see a branch move. I squint, and I look a little closer, really hoping that I could see an owl or a squirrel or something. The branch moves again, and this time I see two glowing circles. I get really excited and think, that's such a huge owl, those eyes are ginormous. My sister is the seeker and comes over and finds me because she knows that I always hide there. When she tags me, I say, hey sissy, look how big the owl's eyes are. And my sister looks and her expression just goes flat. She says, there's nothing there, and... I begin insisting that I see a giant owl, and she keeps insisting that there isn't an owl. This draws all the other girls over, and eventually all of us start walking over to the glass door to see. The branch shakes again, but a lot more violently this time, and we all let out a little squeal, and I say, See, I told you. Alexis starts getting excited too, and then says, Here, let's turn on the outside lights so we can see him better. 
She then turns on the light and we then see this dude sitting in a tree, trying to scramble down the trunk and getting stuck on a branch. We all lose it and start screaming our heads off. This wakes a mum up who comes running down the hallway with a handgun in her hand and PJs on. She was a single mum in the hood and it was a good thing to have. The dude manages to get down right as she gets to the glass. And this badass woman opens the glass, runs into her backyard, gun in hand, and says, you better keep running. Eventually, she comes back in and calms all of us down best that she can while she calls the police and all of our parents too. But since we all live so close though, most of our parents come before the police did. And, unfortunately, after that, we didn't get to sleep over at her house ever again. This happened to me about six months ago. My boyfriend at the time and I were sitting in the living room of my apartment when I heard a knock at the door. My ex asked if I was expecting anyone and I said no, but I would take a look just in case to see who was out there. He stared on the couch while I looked through the peephole. The apartment was set up in a way that didn't allow him to see from the living room to the front door. Outside though, there were two people. One young African-American man looked to be about mid-twenties and a much older Asian man who looked to be about 60-ish. For whatever reason too, I decided to open the door. When I opened it, the young man says, Hi, we're a part of so-and-so religion and we would like to talk to you about it. I have a 50-pound dog who was trying to get out, so I said, Sure, hold on, I'll come back outside because my dog is trying to get out. But this was a huge mistake. I want to clarify that this was very out of character for me too. However, I had recently become closer to God and was wanting to give these people a chance as I didn't believe any harm would come by just listening to what they had to say. So, I step outside and close the door behind me and listen to what they have to say. They said something about how they pray to Mary instead of God because she was the one who birthed Jesus. I don't exactly remember what it was, but something like that. I thank them for their time and they say something like, but thank you guys, stay safe out here. The Asian person visibly starts panicking and saying things that I don't understand in a different language. When I look to the partner to see what he was going to say, he says, no problem, maybe you just want a pamphlet though. I reply, uh, yeah, sure not wanting to be rude and also do some research on the religion as I'd never heard of it before. The guy then says, okay, great, we have them in the car and you can come with us. We're parked right out front. And this is when I started to feel a bit weird. I lived on the third story of an apartment complex that really was not the best and there were no cameras anywhere. Plus, why would they leave their pamphlets in the car like that? If they were going door to door, then it doesn't make much sense to have every person that they intrigued come down to the car, right? And the parking spots outside of my house were almost all handicapped and no one can park there. The Asian person grabbed my arm and started directing me to the stairs. And in a split second, I said, You know what? I'm a Christian and very happy in my faith, but thank you both anyway. The Asian then said something again in a language that I didn't understand, and the man goes, Are you sure? We can get it to you fast. We're parked right there. My heart genuinely sank into my butt at that point, and I started sweating and looking for ways to remove myself from this person's grasp, and the situation entirely too. I know that I must have looked panicked, and honestly, I was. I mean, what do I do? How do I get away from the immediate danger that I just put myself into? I wasn't thinking obviously and just blurted out that I was very sure and yanked my hand from this person who ended up scratching me from their grasp and I just bolted inside. I locked the door behind me and told my boyfriend what happened. That's when he looked at me with a face that I've never seen him make before in my life. He tells me about how that specific religion has been in the news the last few weeks because women have been going missing and the only thing that they have in common is some of their neighbours saying that they'd been solicited by the group the same day or around that day of their neighbour's disappearance. I read some articles to fact check what he was saying and it turns out that he was right. The police were saying that it might be in connection to a sex trafficking ring that was moving from the neighbourhood cities and now were suspected to be in ours. But somehow it gets even weirder because... 
I seriously freaked out and went straight to Facebook Live to share with my friends because I wanted to warn whoever I could that this was happening. I set the privacy to public after the live ended and I went on with my life. I was still a bit shaken, but I was okay. But one week later, I get a Facebook message from someone who is, I'm assuming, part of that religious group, telling me that I need to take the post down, and she was not nice about it. After I said that I wouldn't because I wanted to educate anyone who lives in my town, she told me that I was a spoiled egg and that I would regret ever making this video. I was so scared that I blocked her immediately, set the video to private, and called the police. The police said that they couldn't do much as I didn't have the make or the model of the car that they were in and there was no proof that they had even come to my apartment or who it was. But here's the part that still freaks me out to this day because when I went to show the messages from the Facebook account, I went to unblock the lady and her page was completely deleted. I still had the messages but it was like I was talking to a little grey default profile picture. Even the name had changed to something that seemed to be random clicks on the keyboard. I want to end this too by saying that I'm working on not being such a, a trusting idiot with people. I know the things that I should have done differently and I still get upset with myself for how stupidly I'd acted. So, please be careful out there guys because apparently this group is still very much active. I never really got along with my siblings much when we were younger. My parents spoiled me because I was the youngest, but a lot of the times they would believe my older brothers and sisters rather than me, simply because they were more mature. This whole ordeal started when I was 13 years old though. We used to live in a rural area where there's acres and acres of woodland between houses. A lot of the time my brothers and I would just mess around in the woods, boys being boys sort of thing. We also had an old hound, Benji, that we would take out into the woods as well. Now, the city is not too far away from us and occasionally we would get homeless persons around and tweakers deep in the woods and so on and so forth, but not too many issues. My brothers go back to college too and all that's left there are my parents and my sister. I'd still go out to play in the woods, but I would be by myself or with Benji. And one afternoon I went out with Benji and I noticed that he started acting just really weird. He was whimpering and tail between his legs and everything just kind of staring in one direction. I started getting freaked out and was about to head back when something caught my eye. There was something lying on the ground. I thought that it was an animal because it was furry but then I noticed the blood. I got a little closer and... I saw that it was actually a dog. Its stomach was ripped out and there was just blood everywhere. Its face was mangled and half ripped off blood still dripping from its wounds and Benji started frantically pulling on the leash barking and whimpering behind me. And that was when it hit me. The blood, it was still fresh. Which meant that whatever killed this dog was still around. I froze immediately and I looked around and tried to see what Benji was barking at. I didn't know if it was a black bear or what, but there was definitely something crouched behind a bush. All I could see was fur, but it was the afternoon and it was starting to get darker, so I couldn't really make out what it was. When all of a sudden, this thing started barking. Not like an animal barking, but kind of like a crazy guy imitating a barking dog. He started out low and got louder and louder and I couldn't move and I started hyperventilating and literally pissed my pants. Nothing was going on in my mind and I couldn't think, just scared shitless. He stood up though and started slowly walking toward me but was hesitant because now Benji was barking and growling at him furiously in front of me. Suddenly, he pulled out a giant knife and all I could think was run, run as fast as you can. I don't want to die, I kept thinking to myself. So I just started running as fast as I could. But luckily, Benji ran with me, always circling around me, barking while I was in tears running for my life. Eventually, I got back to my house, ran to my parents and told them what happened. Though they were freaked out, they didn't really believe me and told me that it was probably a bear or something like that. They forbade me to go back outside alone anymore and my sister kept telling me to stop crying out lies just for attention and stuff but 
Uh, later that night, I couldn't sleep at all, and my sister and I shared a room, and Benji would always sleep in our room. I got up and looked out the window every now and then, paranoid that I would see this guy at the edge of the woods or something. At about midnight, I started dozing off again, but then I heard Benji literally growling again. I woke right up, and I instantly saw that he was staring at the window. I slowly crept to the window and looked out to see the figure of this guy right in the middle of the backyard crouched down staring straight at my window. Benji started growling louder and louder and it woke up my sister. She asked me what the hell are you doing up but soon saw that there was something wrong with my expression. When she looked out the window she screamed so loud that it woke my parents up immediately. The guy unfortunately ran back into the woods before my dad got into the room and my sister told them what she saw. Finally, they believed me and called the cops and when the cops got there, they said that there wasn't much that they could do since it was so dark out and they didn't have enough men to put a patrol car at the house. But they said that they'll come back in the morning to do a sweep of the woods around the area where I allegedly found the dog. The next day, they did a search in the woods and they did find the carcass. And a couple of hours after that, too, they also found the creep close by. When they came back to update my parents on the situation, they told them that it was a guy on PCP, covered in blood, wearing the skin of a dead animal. And apparently, he had killed a dog and was eating it raw. He was my first kiss and also first abusive relationship. We started dating when I was a preteen. He was super attentive and protective of me from the very beginning. It wasn't until the fifth month too when I started noticing the alarms going off loudly in my head. He had taken me on a cute roller skating date and we sat down for a bit to take a break when two of his friends showed up. At this point, the vibe from him was no longer safe. The smile that he had five minutes beforehand was replaced with just a, a look of pure hatred. He switched into this odd predator mode kind of and told me to kiss him with tongue in front of his friends. I told him that I just wasn't ready to do something like that and especially not in front of other people. He didn't like that answer and pulled my face to his and started forcing his tongue down my mouth. I was a pretty small girl, but luckily, I was able to push him away long enough to start running towards a more populated part of the skate rink. I told him to stay away from me while I waited for my mum to pick me up. I didn't tell my mum what happened because I was in shock and also kind of confused, I think. I was young and I didn't want to get into trouble for kissing a boy, so I decided to just ignore him until I was able to process everything. A week of successfully avoiding him at school passes when he has worked up the nerve to try something again. He found me surrounded by a group of friends and decided to try his luck. I didn't even notice that he was there, truly, until we were practically bumping elbows. Being that close to him definitely put me on edge and I nearly shit myself when he started speaking to me again. It was all pointless small talk until he realized that I wasn't in the forgiving mood. Then his mood shifted like before and... He was just staring at me like I was the most disgusting human on the planet. I was holding one of those old portable CD players when he yanked it out of my hands and started trying to shove it into his bag in a kind of crappy attempt to steal it. I yelled at him to give it back and tried prying it from him, which he apparently took offense to because he punched me in the face with enough force to drop me to the ground. I obviously started crying and we were both sent to the principal's office. His dad was the football coach in the Midwestern community, so he was able to talk the principal into only requiring his son to attend attention once for this punishment. We didn't see each other too much after that, and thankfully ended up going to different high schools as well. But then, I ran into him at a Taco Bell drive through in my sophomore year. I didn't realize that he was the cashier until I was at the window about to pay, when but we made kind of awkward eye contact. I pretended not to recognize him and hurried with the transaction until I was able to speed away. Unfortunately though, he saw our chance meeting as a sign of fate and attempted to send the equivalent of you up text to my Facebook profile. Unfortunately too, I can never unsee his ultra cringy attempt at flirtation. He said something like, 
I think I saw you at Taco Bell today. I was the cashier, lol. You're pretty cute still, and I was still wondering if you wanted to send some booty pics. Something like that. My response was an immediate block, and I made sure to let my sisters know about the incident, because I just had to tell someone. But if I had known then just how dangerous this teenage boy would become, I wouldn't have taken any of the incidences so lightly, but I'm not a psychic, so I didn't know. After some awkward laughs, though, I moved on with my life and continued to date less shitty people. Fast forward to today, though, when my sister sends me an article from her local news report featuring my dear first boyfriend's picture, and apparently he had decided to stab someone in the throat at a popular venue when they tried defending a woman that he was physically attacking. It was shocking to say the least, but we dated nearly 10 years ago, and I still can't shake that feeling that I definitely dodged a bullet here. It's just a, a strange feeling too when you realize that dangerous people are weaving in and out of your life without you even knowing it before it's too late sometimes too. According to the comments in the article though, he had a habit of assaulting the women in his life and had a history with obsessive stalking. I imagine justice will be served swiftly due to the manner of the crimes and the overwhelming evidence supporting a case against this psychopath, but boy, do I hope that we never see each other again. A couple of years ago, I babysat for a family friend. She and her husband lived with their two kids, a girl about seven, who we'll call Kay, and a boy about twelve, who we'll call Jay. I babysat these kids so much that we actually became quite close. It was kind of a, a brother and sisters type deal. But they weren't difficult kids either. They had a hard home life because their parents were borderline abusive, I would argue, but they were still good kids. And I tried my best to be a positive adult, I was like 18 or 19 during this experience though, in their life. The family moved around a lot and I've known them now for over 6 years, and they've moved every single year I'd say, and this experience happened in 2015. So I was halfway through my senior year when the family moved into this house. It was nice, just built in 2013 or something like that. A nice neighborhood, but the rent was really low, and the mother often bragged about the steal of a deal that she got from the house. To put it into perspective too, the average rent in this area is about $1,200 just for an apartment, and these guys got a whole two-story house, three bed, four baths, freshly built in a nice neighborhood for about $650. I thought that it was weird and asked if there was anything wrong with the house, to which she replied the inspection came back clear. And after I heard that, I really didn't think much beyond that. But when I started babysitting, I immediately just felt like something was off. I have anxiety though, so going to new places really puts me in a funk. So I just figured that it must just be that, and I tried to ignore it. Now, the way the home is set up is actually quite important for this story. On the bottom floor, they had this living room, dining area, and kitchen with some other rooms. I spent most of my time in the living room working on things for school while the kids were upstairs playing games or with their friends and whatnot. But while you're in the living room too, there's a wall that blocks you from seeing the stairs. Upstairs there are bedrooms, immediately off the stairs and above the living room is the parents room which is off limits to all the kids. Then a loft area that looks down over the front door to make a kind of grand foyer feeling. There's a light too that can be on which can be seen from downstairs because of the loft. And then the kids' bedrooms were down a hallway. So, nothing ever really happened at first that was too mind-boggling. Just little noises here and there. Knocks on the walls, things being misplaced, lights flickering, but nothing made me think ghosts automatically. Quite honestly, I just figured that they got what they paid for and also that my memory was garbage. But after a couple of months of that, things started to pick up a bit. The kids, who were usually very sweet and kind to each other, started becoming kind of noticeably more snappy to everyone, especially Jay. He had complained about nightmares that he had started having about someone standing in his doorway just watching him. His parents wouldn't listen though, and their behavior grew even worse as time went on. It was a weekend, I think, and the parents were going to be gone for a while, and the kids were upstairs just doing their thing. I was downstairs in the living room looking at the pizza to order for lunch, when, out of nowhere, I hear really loud footsteps coming from above me in the parents' bedroom. Thunderous, even. 
Thinking that it was the kids being little dingus meats, I immediately headed upstairs to tell them to get out. But when I got there, I was greeted with the two kids standing in their doorways, staring at the closed door to their parents' room, and the footsteps and the bangs were still continuing inside. At this point, I thought for sure that it was an intruder, and instructed the kids to get into their rooms and lock their doors quietly, while I called 911 and explained the situation. As I stayed on the phone, the footsteps continued to walk around the room, and I could hear it moving to different locations of the room even. Two officers arrived, so I grabbed the kids and we waited outside, the banging still continuing as one of the officers escorted us out. But, they came out completely empty-handed, and said that nothing was there, and that it may have been something with the door because the banging stopped as soon as they opened it. But... I had felt the shaking of the floor moving around in the room, so I knew that it wasn't the door. But I guess I'm in denial, and I ignored it and took the kids out for ice cream that afternoon, trying not to think about it. Another time, the kids and I were sitting in the dining area just eating dinner. It was only us three in the house, and from the dining area, you could see the lights upstairs were on, and it was casting a kind of shadow onto the front door. I was making a joke about how I'm the only one who knows how to turn a light off around here when I saw a shadow of a hand from upstairs on the front door and I think that that's when it really started settling down with me that the house was probably haunted. The kids didn't see it and I didn't tell them. I figured that it would just add to the stress that they didn't need and plus it was only a quick glimmer so I'm not even sure that I saw it. I told the parents that night when they came home, but they kind of brushed me off saying that they haven't experienced anything. This continued for a while too, and I would experience something, the kids would, but the parents just wouldn't believe any of this. It was summer when I eventually graduated from high school, and I remember it vividly because I was awake reading articles about a huge shooting that happened in my town. And that was when the banging from upstairs started happening again, and... Quite honestly, I was kind of used to it at this point, but what I wasn't used to was the banging footsteps coming down the stairs. These steps too were methodical and really menacing and I felt a terrible energy in the room and it was cold despite it being in the middle of summer in the south. I counted the seconds between the steps and it was five every single time. I called out to the kids and told them to stop joking around, but... Somehow, deep down, I knew that this wasn't the kids. I was terrified. The footsteps stopped at the bottom of the stairs and I couldn't see who was there. But then, and I'll never forget this, I saw something, an apparition, and it looked like a little girl and she had brunette hair and a red dress. She looked innocent enough, but the energy in the room was so heavy that, quite honestly... I almost threw up. She looked at me and I looked at her. She didn't move. I figured that I must be hallucinating and I began rubbing my eyes, but when I finished rubbing them, she was just right in front of me all of a sudden. In that situation, I couldn't move or do anything. My mind just went to kid brain and I hid underneath the blanket that I was using. I called the parents crying and told them to come back immediately. When they came, the energy in the room lightened, and I finally came out from under the blankets, and she was gone. They asked what was wrong and what happened, and I told them that it didn't matter because they wouldn't believe me anyway. I then informed them to find another babysitter because I would not be returning after that. I still wonder about those kids though, and I really do hope that they ended up okay. I do know that they moved out of the house at the end of the year, but I'm not sure if what I saw was attached to them or not. In fact, I'm still not even sure what I saw. Anyways, if you've made it this far, thanks for listening, and I really appreciate it. Sorry if this is a bit scrambled, but this is just how it plays out in my head anyway. I still have nightmares about that girl, and it's still a, a really frightening event for me,